Welcome to The Great Asian Pushback, a series of podcasts brought to you by the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats, or COUND. The Great Asian Pushback features stories of defiance and hope from Southeast and East Asia. Individuals, young and old, and organizations on the ground and online are assisting authoritarian regimes. There's our voices crying out for freedom and democracy. These podcasts aim to empower and inspire all of you out there who are shining the light on the darkness in this part of the world. Hello, welcome to the Great Asian Pushback, a series of podcasts brought to you by the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats, or CALD. I'm Marites Vitug, a journalist from the Philippines, and I will be your host for this series. In 2020, we saw Bangkok rocked by huge anti-government demonstrations. They were led by a new generation of Thais, students, and the youth. They demanded that parliament be dissolved, that the constitution be rewritten, and also a stop to harassment of critics. But underneath all this is a deeply divided country, from its economy to its politics. It has been more than a year since these protests took place. Today, let's turn our attention to Thailand. I will be speaking to Parit Pocharasit, a former member of the Democrat Party, a young, 28 years old, and promising activist and leader. Currently, he holds he heads a technology startup focusing on education. Parit will be joining us from Bangkok. Welcome to the podcast, The Great Asian Pushback, Parit. We're glad that you'll be able to spend time with us. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure. Yes, first, let's talk about the big picture. Uh, Thailand has been described as one of the most unequal societies in the world, that it's a highly divided country, politically, economically, and socially. Do you see these divisions and inequality as the most pressing problems of Thailand? Do you share this analysis? Yes, I think certainly um, inequality in a broad sense is probably one of the biggest problems that Thailand currently faces, both economically, socially, and politically. Um, I actually have this theory that there are about kind of eight dimensions of inequality that is rising um, in Thailand. And it's actually, if you spell out the eight um, dimensions, it actually spells out the word Thailand. So Thailand is almost an acronym for these eight dimensions. So I think if I go through one by one very quickly, then we can dive deep um, into any particular one which you feel we, we should. I think the first one, the letter T, right, um, stands for technology. So we're seeing rising kind of what we call digital divide. Um, especially since COVID has come in, we've seen that the quality of life of people who are able to access um, the online world is much greater than people who could not. So students who have access to smartphones can still continue to learn online, whereas students who are not able to access smartphones cannot. Right? So that's, I think, one, one rising um, type of inequality that we see um, more clearly during COVID. Um, the letter H stands for healthcare. So I think we've also had um, a lot of healthcare um, inequalities in healthcare access. So Thailand has three um, public health care schemes, one for civil servants, one social security for employees, and then one which is the, the national health care um, insurance. Um, we uh, see that the budget that is being allocated per person for these three schemes are very different. So the, the, per, the per person budget for uh, the civil servants scheme is much, much higher than for the, the national health care plan, which means that people um, although everyone can access healthcare at affordable level or as, as a right, um, the quality of services and treatment they get is very different. Um, if I go to the third letter A, um, stands for affluence. So we see um, rising um, in income inequality and wealth inequality, right? So we're seeing that um, there have been moves um, in the past to try and um, close this gap of wealth inequality. And I think you will see in the Credit Suisse report that Thailand is was number one a few years ago, and I think it's now number three in terms of um, the most unequal in terms of wealth. So there have been attempts to try and uh, bridge this gap um, through kind of land taxes and inheritance taxes, but they have not been too fruitful or effective um, in doing that. Um, the letter I um, then stands for identity. So we also see kind of problems of gender inequality um, in Thailand. I think one thing that we that a few parties have been pushing and I tried to push as well back when I was in the Democrat Party was to push for same sex marriage. That still has not happened. Um, so I think there is still um, great amounts of gender inequality, not also um, including kind of sexual harassment problems that we see facing women in Thailand. Um, the letter L then is on learning. 
So this is inequality in education, which is an area that I'm, I'm currently working in through my startup. So we see that um, when the top schools in Bangkok open, people have to compete to get the limited seats there because they have a high level of, of teaching quality. Whereas the majority of schools in Thailand, more than 50% of schools in Thailand are what we classify as small schools with fewer than 120 students. And most of them will lack or have insufficient teachers. So some schools have teachers, have fewer teachers in grade levels. So you end up with one teacher having to teach multiple grade levels, which is almost imposs an impossible task, no matter how talented that teacher is. Right? Um, then the, the next one is that the letter A stands for area. So we also see uh, inequalities between different regions. So Bangkok has about a tenth of the population um, of Thailand, but has about a third of the GDP. So we we'll still see Thailand being a country where most of the development still relies on the capital city or on one city, um, which I think is, 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 is a problem that's been around for quite a long time. The letter N, penultimate letter N, stands for natural resources. Um, this for me um, is to do with land inequality. So we see at the moment land possession is also an area um, which is highly unequal. So you have some people holding a large amount of land, whereas the agricultural workers who are relying on, on good, good quality land to actually um, uh, make income, most of them don't actually own their own land. So then we get into um, a huge um, problem there. And then the final one, letter D, is on democracy. So we are operating under a constitution that currently does not give us one, one um, does not give everyone an equal right um, to determine um, how this country is run. We don't have one, one, one person, one vote because um, to elect the prime minister, apart from the 500 elected MPs, um, you have the 250 unelected senators who were appointed by the military government back when they were in power um, um, to come and vote for the, for the prime minister. So actually, when, I, when you calculate mathematically, it actually means that the um, Prayuth regime, which controls these unelected senators, have more than or have an equivalent to 19 million uh, votes combined from the people. So even if 19 million people want the, the country to head one way, but the prior youth regime wants the country to head the other way, uh, the latter will win. So this for me is like, I think encapsulates the, the, the eight letters, right? That spell out Thailand, encapsulates the eight, the eight dimensions of inequality that we're seeing in this country. This is a great analysis you've done, Parit, but how do you attack these eight dimensions? I mean, how do you change? Do you start with the D, democracy? Is there a hierarchy? And how do, will you go about uh, pushing at uh, changing parts of Thai society. Yep. So I, I don't think we can prioritize one over the other. I think all are equally important. But I think you are right with the the premise that the let, the D or the political um, equality is probably the 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 first step um, towards fixing all this, right? Because um, if you try to fix all the other, but you don't democratize the country, um, then 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 it becomes very difficult. So for example. Um, if you still operate under this constitution, right? So even if the people, um, um, let's say, have a policy that they feel can really address this inequality, let's say there's a policy to redistribute the budget to really create um, a, a sufficient uh, and high quality welfare state within the country, that can never be implemented um, if we're still operating under this um, semi-democratic system. Because even if it can gather the, the, the mandate or, or the approval from over 50% of the population. But if it contradicts with the interests of the Prayut regime, which is actually backed up by oligopolies in Thailand and a network of like military and, 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 and large companies, then it's, it's very hard to, to see that being pushed through. And I think this is what we see happening in parliament at the moment. Yes, we do have a parliament, which is a, 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 a step from back um, from three or four years ago where we were in a complete kind of dictatorial re regime. But if you look at the, the, the national budget distribution, even though we're facing COVID, we saw that actually the, the budget for healthcare fell, the budget for education fell, um, but actually it's budget for certain military units rose. So I think you can see that at the moment, um, the letter D is probably the biggest problem we need to fix. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to fix other problems because the, the budget is not going to be distributed in a way that is most beneficial to the people. I think you've said this in other interviews, but can you please explain how to uh, fix democracy or how to make Thai society more democratic? Is it through amending the constitution? Is that the first step that you should take? Yes, I, I, I think the constitution is a big issue. So I think if you look at the bigger picture, right, I think to get to, to have a society that is fully democratic, you need two things. One is you need a democratic system. And then secondly, you need a democratic culture. 
I think for Thailand, these two things are going in opposite direction. On the culture front, we're actually seeing new, newer generations being more, uh, more um, loud in calling for democracy, being more um, loud in their support for democracy. You see they're pushing not just for democratic rules, but you're, they're also pushing for policies that embody democratic values of um, equality and liberty, right? So if you go on the street and look at the, what they're saying at the protest, um, at the protest um, events, they're not just calling for um, free and fair elections or democratic constitution. They're also calling for policies like same-sex marriage, policies like abol abolishing conscription, right, which embody kind of democratic and liberal values. So on the one hand, you have a society fueled by technology and 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 being more loud in their in their in their want of a democracy. But on the other hand, you have a system and a set of laws, especially the constitution, that is backward. The current constitution. Um, if you um, assess the content of it, it's even less democratic than um, the constitution that we had 20 years ago, back in 1997. So you see that the, the country has actually regressed constitutionally. Um, so unless you fix the constitution, I think these two things are going to go in opposite direction and, and it's going to create um, this conflict that we see on the street. Um, in the a question of how and, and, and what we should do to fix the constitution. So I think firstly, just to give context on what the problem of the, con the current constitution is. So I think the, the constitution at the moment uh, falls short of um, um, democratic standards, both on its origin, process, and content. Right on its origin, the current constitution was not drafted with a lot of participation from the people. It was written by essentially the people in power, um, the Prayut regime, back when they were in full dictatorship mode. Right, it was written by a few people behind closed doors, and even the ju the current justice minister, who is one of the key ministers under the Prayut regime openly said in an interview that it was designed, the constitution was designed to serve their interests. So they're, they're quite blatant about this in the sense that it was written to extend their power beyond um, after the military government um, transition towards election. Right? So um, it has undemocratic origins. It also has an undemocratic process of ratifying. So there was a referendum, a referendum that was held to ratify the constitution, but it was not a free and fair one. People who opposed the constitution were not allowed to actually freely campaign. A few people came out to, to, to talk about why they feel people should not accept the constitution and vote no were actually arrested. Right? And if you look at the constitution referendum questions, it was also not a straightforward question, but a, a very intentionally sophisticated and leading question to get people to vote yes. And then finally on the content, right? we have a constitution that has increased the powers of many unelected bodies that are controlled by the private regime. We have an unelected um, set of senators who can vote for prime minister. You have um, the constitutional court and independent organizations who hold the elections being appointed by the senators who are also appointed by the Prayut regime. Um, you have this um, me new mechanic called the 20 year national strategy plan, which on the surface might seem harmless, but it actually says that if, if any government comes in and doesn't do the policy um, that is completely in line with this plan that's been written by the Prayut regime, then that government could be ousted out of office. Um, so at the moment, it's not being used because Prayut is in charge. But if uh, the opposite um, or a different government comes in, then, then this weapon could be could be activated as well. So that is the problem with the current constitution. Now, to fix it, it's hard as well because um, the constitution also stipulates that to amend any article, you need the approval of at least a third of the 250 um, Prayut appointed senators. So this is what we've seen in the past two years. No matter how much um, um, the public has like collected signatures to submit a draft into parliament. Um, anything that contradicts the interests of these senators and the private regime has been voted down. So this is why people are losing hope with this parliamentary process, whether um, they can really push through change um, through that channel. So that's kind of the, the conundrum that we're, we're in at the moment. But Parit, are you still doing educational campaigns, information campaigns on the constitution? And are you still hopeful given that the past efforts to amend the constitution have been have reached a dead end. Yes, I'm, I'm still hopeful. Um, I think we in Thailand, if we want to see political change, we really have to remain hopeful um, because on paper it, it doesn't look that hopeful. Um, but so since I left the Democrat Party after the election, I form a group called Collab, which stands for Constitutional Laboratory, where we try to do basically what you mentioned to educate people about the, the current problems. Um, of the, the, the constitution. So we held workshops both offline and online 
almost like a hackathon style event to get people to come and draft their own their dream constitution and in the process understanding what are the problems with the current constitution and then most recently we actually um, joined with another group to form an umbrella group called Resolution, where we actually um, uh, went around and did a campaign to collect signatures to submit to parliament. So this is actually a, a formal channel that is supported by the, the current law. So if you want to submit a constitutional amendment, amendment draft, you need 50,000 signatures from the public. So we went, went around and did that since April. We now have 150,000 signatures, so three times more than what we actually needed um, that we submitted to parliament. So hopefully, um, the, the, the current the process at the moment is they're checking through the signatures to make sure they are valid. Um, and then I think um, after that, um, hopefully this draft will be debated in parliament. I, I'm thinking probably in the fourth quarter of this year. So we still remain hopeful. And I think um, the reason that we remain hopeful is because we see that even though on paper, it looks like the senators would never vote for anything against their interests. We noticed that in the past couple of times where um, constitutional amendment drafts were considered in parliament, even though it didn't get more than a third of the senators. We saw a few senators switching their, their stance because of public pressure. Right? So when, when the public pressure was very high um, back um, last November, we saw actually there were 50 senators who voted to remove their own powers to elect prime minister, which is probably the, the key problem, the biggest problem with this current constitution. So we see we see the, the the direct effect of how people's voices um, really can switch um, the senator's um, stance. So I think we need to remain hopeful that that, that will be the case. So you're doing uh, quite substantial and exciting work on this constitution. Are your signatories just among the youth, the students, or it's representative of a large sector of Thailand? Um, actually, we haven't done like a formal analysis um, of this, but at least um, on the days where I, where I was spending as an admin checking through the documents, I think I noticed um, um, not just the youth. I think it's probably true that the youth probably um, um, is the larger um, segment of these 150,000 signatures, but we, um, but we also see people um, definitely, um, definitely um, of all um, geographies and regions, but I think we also see people of all age groups as, as well. But I think one interesting thing and one thing that we need to be mindful of is there is always a cost we pay every time we gather signatures. So before our resolution campaign, there was another campaign before us headed by um, an organization called ILaw. I mean, I was part of this um, kind of backup team and a, one of the signatures there as well, but not, not a former. Not India, no. So they, they gathered 100,000 signatures to submit to parliament, which was then voted down. So when we did our campaign, um, even though we were able to get some people who maybe the first time didn't agree with constitutional change and then ended up agreeing the second time. There were also a few drop-offs. So there were people who had signed for the I-Law campaign previously and then said to us, why am I signing again? Last time I signed, look, look what parliament did with my, with, my, with my signature. So I'm not gonna sign again, there's no point. This is very dangerous because as soon as you take away that hope that change can be enabled and enacted through, parliament, through parliamentary politics, then, then the people will start thinking that the only way that we, they can get change is to is to go to the streets, and that, that is why we we are seeing protesters right now. They're, they're not they're not completely wrong in in thinking that right because the parliamentary channel has has been blocked more and more um, over the past few years. But don't you see the public protests and the the, the avenue you're using to amend the constitution complement each other? Public pressure from you and also the parliament of the streets is that a good combination? Yes, um, they de definitely complement each other. And I think that that's important. Um, I mean, this this draft that we have gathered, um, uh, that we've submitted to Parliament, it's not going to pass if there's no public pressure. Um, and I think the two data points that we saw, so there was one, there was a draft that was submitted two times on removing um, senators' um, power to vote for PM. One time was back in November where public pressure was high. The other time was submitted by political parties back in um, earlier this year. And you saw that the first time when public pressure was high, 50 senators voted for it. Then for the second time, when there was no public um, attention and it was, it was political parties just submitting a draft, there were only 20 senators voting for it. So you see that the lack of public pressure meant that there was a drop off in senators um, supporting it. And there's, there's no logical, there's no other logical reason to explain why that is the case apart from um, the, the loss of public pressure. So I think that's why um, the timeline is going to be crucial because when we see, um, like when this draft is going to be debated in parliament, um, hopefully there will be public momentum 
that 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 helps us send us into parliament um, at the same time as well. Otherwise, it's going to just get watered down by by MPs and senators as it had been done. Yeah. Uh, Farid, you left the Democrat Party, I think, a few years ago. So, do you think what you're doing now is more effective than being a member of a of a political party? <laughs> um, so, I left the Democrat Party as soon as the they joined the current government, and that was kind of for two reasons. One is the Democrat Party during the election promised to not support General Priyut, right? So me as a constituency as a constituency MP, I went around telling everyone in my constituency that we're not going to support Priyut. So number one is I have to apologize to them, right? Because it means that the votes that they had that that they maybe they gave to me is now is now used to support and prop up General Priyut. But secondly, I also feel that joining the government um, headed by Priyut and headed by by Palang Basharat Party. Um, it's almost the Democrat condoning um, the undemocratic measures in which these parties have used to get into power, not to talk about the corruption allegations that we're seeing with this current government. So that was kind of why I left the, the, the Democrat Party, it was not, not just because I felt that maybe um, doing stuff outside parliament might work better, uh, but I felt that my ideology and the Democrat Party's ideology are no longer aligned. Um, but having said that, I do feel that, I do feel disappointed at the way the Democrat Party uh, have used their position in government to push for or, or to not push enough for constitutional change because actually the Democrat Party um, um, publicly announced when they joined the government that one of the three preconditions for joining um, with General Priyut was to amend the constitution and now we have seen uh, that that time has passed like over two and a half years but no progress on the constitution at all the only draft that has been passed uh, actually was just passed in the second reading yesterday onto the third and final reading was on the electoral system, which is not like the key problem of this current constitution. And I don't want this to send send a message to the to the public that look, if you want to amend amend the constitution, get it passed in parliament, it has to be on issues like the electoral system where parties have things to gain and lose, uh, rather than things that are at the core root or core problem of the constitution, which is the the the, the expansion of of unelected bodies. Um, so yeah, so I mean, have been quite disappointed by the way the Democrat Party have used their position to 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 negotiate and push for constitutional um, amendment. So I, I had to say whether this route that I'm taking is more effective or not, but at least it's more in line and more 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 true to my ideology. You know what's impressive from outside as we watch Thai politics is the participation of the youth. As, as I've said, you know, the protests, what you're doing to amend the constitution. And then there's also a youth-led party, the Move Forward Party, which apparently has made a big impact on, on Thai politics. So what, in your analysis, is the impact of this youth-led party, the, the Move Forward Party? And then we can talk about your plans later. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Move Forward Party, or, or back then at the election, was a future forward party. Um, um, really changed Thai politics and it really dis disrupted Thai politics in many sense. And um, I think number one is um, we have never seen this phenomenon in the past where um, there, it's almost like a startup political party, right? So like even myself, when I when I joined the Democrat Party, it was before Future Forward came, came in. And I was always under the impression that um, Thai, Thai politics is it's, it's very hard to start up a new party and, and make breakthroughs right? because of the, the existing structure that is in place. So when they were able to do this and even become the third largest party, I think that 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 raised kind of all, all, uh, expanded people's imagination in terms of what's possible to do in politics. Right. So I think that that, that is something which we we should all kind of um, admire what Future Forward has been able to do. But I think since then, um, so since they, 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 they became the third largest party and got into parliament, I think we are seeing two, I would say like two dimensions, which I think Move Forward has really, has really um, um, positively contributed to, to Thai society. One is I think we are seeing a Move Forward party um, um, pushing for more progressive content than we have seen by, by other parties beforehand. So I think the, um, most recently, I think they became the first um, political party in Thai history to submit for an amendment to Article One One Two of the Criminal Law, right, which is the current the current defamation law that is that um, against the monarch, right. We've seen that this this law is something which has been sensitive in the past. We've never seen parties talk about it. Um, even actually, Future Forward back when they were campaigning did not talk about this um, really as well. But when they got into power 
And now that they see the youth calling for reforms of the monarchy, they have responded by submitting um, this draft into parliament. Um, I think that that is something which we are seeing um, in terms of them pushing for more and more progressive content in parliament and, and making certain um, proposals which we may have thought beforehand were not possible to do in parliament now possible, right? And I think um, if you speak it from a from a from a, um, a rational point of view, we are seeing a lot of problems with this current Article One One Two, right? Um, yes, sure, other countries that are um, democratic and have a constitutional monarch also may have defamation laws against the monarch, but it's definitely not with an imprisonment or with with a sentence of three to fifteen years in prison. And we've seen that this law in the past has been used on cases that do not pro probably do not constitute defamation, but actually it's more of a constructive or general criticism, right? Um, so we see a lot of problems with this law, but no political other political party has tried to amend this law, and now we see move forward doing that. So I think that's one one dimension of change that we're seeing. So pushing for more progressive content. The second dimension is, um, I would say, like a more progressive progressive style of politics. I think we've seen like uh, move forward try to introduce kind of more, I would say, like up to date um, way of doing things in parliament. So things like, but like even simple things like using like PowerPoint presentations in parliament, right, and and kind of. Um, clearly showing the problems that they are talking about. Or there was one particular um, uh, time in Parliament where they had a QR code. Uh, they put a QR code up and asked people to participate along with the with the with the the motion that they were proposing. So so these are just kind of little measures, which I think is quite it's a breath of fresh air, right? And I think since the clubhouse, um, I don't know if it's popular in, in other ASEAN countries, but since the clubhouse social media came in, um, we see a lot of MPs from from move forward. Um, use that as a channel to co to have two-way communication with their voters, right? And it reduces the distance that people feel between themselves and politicians. Uh, I think that that's crucial, and it makes everything more transparent, more accountable, um, and and much more much more direct. Right? So I think that that's the positive side. But of course, there is a challenge, right? Which is number one is um, how do you um, how do you um, maintain this new way of operating um, amidst the uh, on the backdrop of quite regressive laws right and we see we see challenges with this because um even though they got voted with 80 mps we saw a few of the mps defected to the government side because then you start seeing the government parties using kind of the old style politics um of you know allegations about them giving giving money to these mps to switch sides so it's going to be a challenge for move forward in terms of how they can still survive amongst on, on this backdrop of quite regressive laws right not not to say that they're also the target of um of um the political elite in terms of um in terms of um we've seen in terms of the dissolution of the move for um the future forward party back then as well but uh but it, earlier when you were with the democrat party you formed a group called new them uh did you envision this to be like a move forward party like more progressive uh composed of young people or maybe tell us what new them was able to do and if, if it's still around yeah so it's not around anymore um but I think a lot of the ideas that we had um, were quite similar to what, um, coincidentally quite similar to what um, Future Forward had as well. Um, so my idea or the first conception of New Dem, although it was launched, actually it was launched after Move Forward, but it was kind of conceived a little bit um, beforehand. But back then I think we had similar ideas, but different channels. So we, uh, as I mentioned, I, didn't, I, I did not foresee the possibility of even starting a new party. Um, so what I felt was needed um, was that um, we wanted to gather a group of more progressive-minded um, um, people who wanted to see progressive change and try to push for more progressive policies within the Democrat Party. So what happened was we formed a group of about 20 people, um, some of whom ran as candidates, some of whom did not. And what we, we did as a group was propose policies that we felt were more progressive or were, were neglected by the, the, the existing um, structure of the party. So things like same-sex marriage, things like um, abolition conscription were two of the policies that we had proposed to the party. So I think what we tried to do was to to make to try and um, I guess repivot the Democrat Party to become more in line with what we feel are liberal liberal democratic values um, and, and more progressive values. So it was more kind of change from within the party. Um, and I think the the when when the the Democrat Party after the election decided to join. Um, this government, I think it became clear that this tactic did not work because um, it's almost a, a, a pivot back to, um, I wouldn't even say conservative, but undemocratic values, right? So 
So in, in that sense, I think New Dem failed in its mission to try and um, make the Democrat Party become more progressive in what or what we define as more progressive and more liberal. Um, and I think um, since the since the that decision by the party to join the government, I left and many other New Dem members also left and the, the group kind of just um, disbanded. And now each of us has kind of gone in, sep um, in, in separate ways in separate directions. You know, Parit, you're really quite young for someone to talk a lot about politics and systemic change. So maybe on the personal level, why are you so interested in politics? What led you to this? Actually, I have to say, in, in, in the landscape of Thai politics, I actually feel old. Because if you look at the, the protest leaders um, at the moment, they're oh, they're so much younger than, than I am. <laughs> um, but, <coughs> but <coughs> sorry. <coughs> But to say kind of why I was interested in politics, right? so it was quite a tough decision. I think there's a very personal anecdote, but I was, um, before I left for politics, I was um, a consultant at McKinsey. So quite a stable job, um, going quite well, really enjoying what I was doing. Um, but the reason I decided to leave and join politics, I mean, I, I had always um, dreamt about doing politics, right? Because I felt that that was um, the best way to change the, the country at a structural level. So if you do other jobs, yes, you can contribute to country in, in some other way. But if you want to really change the country, you need to change the structure, the laws, the policy. And that means kind of entering politics and getting the mandate from the people to do that. Right. <clears throat> but the reason I decided to, to leave at that particular time was because I felt kind of after so many years of um, dictatorial regime, right, um, um, there were a lot of people in my generation and maybe younger who felt that um, it was time to kind of do something about it. Um, and I felt that the country was at an inflection point where um, what happens like today is really going to shape what is going to happen in the next 10, 20 years. So it's a, an important inflection point, which I feel that um, if anyone is ready to, to come in and, and try and push for this change, they need to do it now. And I think with the, with the country and the world changing at a faster pace, it also means that there are a lot of gaps in certain areas where the youth can really fill, right? So I, I take the example of, of let's say, like, even something as as um, as um, non-controversial as like policy on sports, right? So because you have younger generations who are much more familiar with esports, it means that there is a gap um, on, on um, in this area where the youth can can come into play and not just make up the numbers, but actually lead um, um, certain policy areas, right? So in that sense, there is a greater space for the youth to really have a voice and to really take leadership. So, so with that in mind, I felt that with kind of with the political climate at its inflection point, and with the with kind of more open space for the youth to operate and to lead in, it was time for me as back then I think a 24, 25 year old to to quit my job in the private sector and and to and to to come to, to come down this path. Yeah. But what shaped you personally? Your education, your upbringing, the values your parents taught you, or yeah, what what really shaped you to be the person you are today? Yeah, I think um, paradoxically, um, what really um, what really led to me seeing more problems about Thailand and giving more, more giving me more motivation to try and to change Thailand was when I had a chance when I got a scholarship to go and study abroad in the UK. Um, because before then I was only living in, in Thailand, right? So the problems that we see, um, things like inequality in the in the in education, inequality in healthcare. Whenever we, I, I start to ask questions, and whenever I ask kind of the, the adults in the society, like, oh, why, why is this a problem? Why can't we fix this? The, the response that I get will, will be something along the lines of, it's always been like this. You can't fix it. It's natural, right? But then when I went to the UK, I see a different world, right? I see two countries, if you start comparing UK and Thailand, um, that have many similarities, right? It's almost the same geographical size, the same number of population, supposedly the same kind of similar, kind of similarly unique um, history, right, and supposedly the same political system. So, um, um, a democracy with parliamentary uh, democracy and a constitutional monarch, right. But on the other hand, that some of the outcomes are so contrasting, right. In Thailand, I mentioned already. I mean, my parents are state hospital doctors as well, so I see firsthand the level of inequality in the quality of treatment at different hospitals in different areas. But in in the UK, you have this national health service. And you see that if you fall ill, regardless of where you are in the country, you are almost guaranteed to have like a good quality hospital next to your home. Um, if you go to um, like the, the closest school next to your home, 
you're almost guaranteed that the quality is not going to be super different, or at least compared to Thailand, not as unequal as we see in Thailand. So, so we see what's possible there, and then we see what's happening in Thailand. And I remember um, the first time that there was a military coup um, in Thailand, I was in the UK studying as well. And it was a concept that was completely like bizarre to me, right, as to why, like in the UK, we see like every political conflict is solved via parliament, via elections. But in Thailand, why, why does the army have such an important role to play, right? Like in, in the UK, no one knows who the head of the army is, right? No one cares. But in Thailand, like that, that is such an important position that like all political analysts talk about, right? So yeah, so this is a contrasting outcome that I see from two countries with similar assets and similar history and similar size and population. So for me, that that for me, like logically, it means that look, it, it's not impossible for Thailand to 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 change in that way. Um, it just needs kind of a group of people to to come in and try and try and 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 drive the country towards where we want it to be. So that that's kind of like, I guess my my personal um, my first motivation. Um, or first first thought of why I wanted to do politics. Yes, but now you have a startup a company on education and technology, but when it comes to politics, what are your plans? Do you have any plan to join a political party or tell us maybe a peek into your future? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're right. So my, my top priority right now is, of course, I'm doing this startup, right? And I think um, it was a big decision for me to, to undertake as well, because after I left the Democrat, I started to ask myself, like, while I'm not yet in politics, what can I do to contribute to this country? And I know that education is one of the most important problems that, that Thailand faces, right? Almost every problem that we see in politics cannot be entirely um, um, solved without solving the education system, right? If you want the country to grow economically, you need to equip people with the right skills. That means reforming a very outdated uh, um, curriculum in Thai education, which does not do enough to equip uh, people with the kind of the competency and the critical thinking or the communication and teamwork skills that are needed. If you want to resolve the inequality issue, we need to um, fix the intergenerational inequalities that are passed through from parents to children. And unless you ensure that every child gets an equal access to high quality education, that, then that's not possible. Right? So that's why kind of I decided, okay, while I'm not yet in politics, I will try and uh, make an impact to the, to the private sector by doing this startup in, in education technology, right? Um, I still believe that in the long run, um, if we want to see structural change, I still um, stick to what I believe that that structural change needs to happen through politics. So one day I will hope to return there. Um, and if you ask me kind of what, like, am I working with different, different political parties? So in our campaign to amend the constitution, we have, I have been working quite closely with the progressive movement, which is of course consists of um, former members of the of the Future Forward Party, and I've also kind of been in communication and in discussion with the Move Forward Party as well, especially on policies regarding um, education. So in that sense, probably ideologically a lot more aligned to to what Move Forward Party is doing, what the progressive movement is is doing, um, but in terms of my um, future um, and when I will return to politics, I think that's much more up in the air because my top priority is to get this startup working and, and make more impact there first. Yes, a final question, Parit. How do you inspire other people, younger people? Because you say you feel old in Thai politics, <laughs> but how do you inspire other younger people to be engaged like you are in, in hoping to change Thai society? Yeah. Um, I actually don't think they need a lot of inspiring. <laughs> I think the, the youth in Thailand right now is more active and more engaged than ever, right? I mean, every time um, the government does something, we see like social, like if you go on Twitter in Thailand, right? The number one trend is almost always on politics or on like, um, like a certain um, policy issue or a certain like action that the government did that day, right? So you see like the youth being very active in terms of um, not just using that, political rights in terms of going to the, the ballot box and choosing the party that they, 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 they want to represent them, but also being active in terms of checking and balancing what the government does at every critical step, right? And a lot of the time, these kind of actions have actually resulted in the government shifting its policy. So I remember there was a, there was an, a, a time where uh, the government was going to use a certain amount of budget to buy new submarines, right? Using a lot of but, um, taxpayers' money to buy submarines during the COVID crisis, right? So obviously the, the, the youth-led kind of groups um, started voicing out, um, like it hit like 
it became like the number one hashtag on Twitter saying like, hey, like, I don't want you to buy submarines, right? And in, in, in the end, uh, the government had to back down. So you're seeing that this kind of youth-led movement outside parliament is creating some impact in terms of the government decision. So I think they don't need too much inspiring in terms of um, like being active politically. I think the, the more, um, the greater um, area which we need to push on is to push the people in power to actually start compromising, right? Because right now I, I, I say the country is almost in a democratic tug of war game. So on the one hand, you have this like youth led society that is super progressive, super active, super interested in politics, trying to push the country one way, but you have a regressive system, regressive set of laws that is under the, in, in the control of a few people that is pushing the country the other way. And now there's a tension, right? And that tension basically um, is encapsulated or is, is visualized by protests on the street. And the longer this regressive system does not change, the longer that the people in power do not compromise and do not try and listen to the, um, the, the, the protesters' demands and concerns and try to um, lead the country towards a, a new constitution where everyone can, can, can feel a part of and everyone has a part in, in writing and in verifying, um, then suddenly the, the, the protesters and the younger generation are going to feel that they cannot get changed through parliamentary politics. The only, the only way they can get changed is to go onto the streets. And that is a process that has happened over the past seven years. If you, if you put yourself in the minds of an average protester right now who's 25 years old, right? When she was 18, instead of voting at her first election, that was a military coup that took that right away from her. Then she has been pretty much, since her university days, been used to just one prime minister. Um, when she was 21, was probably the first time she went to the ballot box, but that was to vote in a constitution referendum where she had very little information to access, right? Then at the general election, she knew that she was up against 250 unelected senators, but she still came out to vote anyway in full force to elect a party that would be her representative. Um, then one year later, that party was dissolved. So she no longer has a representative in parliament. And then the, the next year, she tried to, um, she signed to submit a constitution draft to parliament, which was voted down. So over the past seven years, we're talking about a young generation that has been very patient in trying to drive change through actually unfair set of rules that have been put in place by the people in power and have seen that change not happening. So now um, what I worry about is if the government does not give way and try to compromise, the younger generations are going to lose hope with these formal channels and they're going to look at more informal channels to try and drive change. And then it's it's harder to, to predict where that is going to lead. So I think for me, it's, I think it's less of a role for me in inspiring the youth, but more of a role um, for me in terms of how do we pressure and convince the people in power to give way and compromise towards this inevitable tide and winds of change. Yes, final, final question, Parit. Because we are, we are in a pandemic, how has this affected your work as a, in the Constitution, the other student activists? Has it uh, slowed them down? Or what do you think is the impact on, on Thai politics? Yeah, so I think COVID has definitely meant that like um, physical forms of protesting have been harder. So I think in terms of our constitution, our constitutional movement, um, in terms of signature, it's not affected much because we were able to uh, get signatures online. Um, but it meant that the plans that we had to go around the country to um, um, to to knock on doors, to do like sessions in different provinces and educate people about the constitution had to be put to the side. And I think in terms of the, the protesters um, that are on the streets, like they had to find new ways to, to protest as well. Um, so in a way, the, the physical protesting, the physical activities are, uh, are on the fall. But I think the dissatisfaction with government is actually on the rise because people start to realize that uh, like COVID is a, is a tough crisis to manage, right? So what, what, is what, what has happened is two things. Number one is I think it's exposed the incompetencies of the current government in handling this crisis. And people start to see that actually uh, COVID crisis and political crisis are not two separate things, but they're intertwined. So when you have non-transparent politics, it means that you don't have transparency on the vaccine plans. You don't have transparency on decision making that lead to the country choosing one vaccine over the other. You don't see the trans, the, the con you have no transparency in terms of the, the contracts that the government enter with other um, kind of vaccine vendors, right? So they see this, this overlapping between political crisis and COVID crisis. So that's one thing. The second thing is they realize that no matter how dissatisfied they are with the government in terms of their handling of this COVID crisis, they cannot change anything. 
because the constitution dictates that even though more than 50% of the population want change, provided the unelected senators that they control do not want change, then nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna happen. So I think in a way, COVID has highlighted um, the political crisis that we are in. And people are starting to see that, um, like this issue of the constitution, which might seem so abstract to begin with, really actually has an impact on the quality of life of, 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 of the people. So, so I think that that is a, um, a positive um, change that we are seeing. Um, and, and we see many people who beforehand may not have spoken out too much on politics um, have now realized that they, they need to um, in order to, 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 to call for um, substantial change. Thank you so much, Parit. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. It's also refreshing to listen to a young voice uh, explain Thailand to us. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for keeping us company. Keep pushing back against autocracy. Keep fighting for democracy. The Great Asian Pushback is produced by the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats with the support of the Friedrich Nauman Foundation for Freedom. This episode was made by Marites Vito, Lito Arlegue, and Paulo Zamora with creative input from Jaja Hanolo, administrative assistance from Audi Frias and Chelsea Caballero, and editing by Point B Multimedia. <laughs>